Glasgow uh, between uh, this month, between 1st and 12th November. We're going to, in short, this uh, conference, we're going to be calling it COP26. We're going to look at what it means for Rwanda, the outcomes, as well as Rwanda's climate change uh, actions, as well as investment and financing plans. I'm very happy to welcome on this show, on this topic tonight with us. Uh, I will start by welcoming Teddy Mugabo, who is the CEO of the Rwanda Green Fund, also known as Fonerwa. Uh, Teddy Mugabo, welcome to the square. Thank you. Great. Um, thank you very much, Teddy. I would like uh, cameras to also stay on the next guest. Um, I'd like to welcome, on behalf, on behalf of the Rwanda Environment Management Authority, Deputy Director General Fosta Munyazikuye, uh, welcome to the square. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Great. My name is Dan MPC, host of The Square. As always, I'm joined by The Squares and Panelists. I'll start by welcoming The Squares and Panelists, who was not here last week. <laughs> Great to see you on this show. Charles Haber, welcome to the, sh to the square. Let me add in, but I missed you guys. How are you? Oh, Good. Uh, you. Happy belated. Yeah. <laughs> and happy belated birthday. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> also, resident panelist on the square is Brenna Namata. Brenna, great to have you on the square. Thank you, Diana. Um, before we go back to our guests, um, uh, you know, to dive into the topic, like we always do, we have midweek highlights that I would like the Square panelists to share. A lot has been happening this week, um, so let's keep it brief and tight. Any midweek highlights, Charles, you'd like to share with the, the viewers? Um, I was telling people earlier on that um, the national police is broke, and I think we said it one time on the show, they've proved this to us. They've been collecting billions, in my opinion, until they come out clean to say they've been collecting nothing. Um, when you are finding motorists for driving slowly, now they want to collect trillions because the billions were sweeter for getting us to drive slower. Now, So, Charles, if yes. you, if, other than talking in parables, what exactly are you trying to say about the Rwanda National Police? I think and they, the situation at hand. I think they're, they're going to overtake Rwanda Revenue Authority in terms of <laughs> how much they collect. So you don't think this is a road safety This measure? has nothing at all to do with safety. It's an economic decision. Really? Yes. Oh, I think, I think that, I, and he said this before on the show, those are loaded I comments. Um, I, I was listening to a couple of, a couple of shows uh, this yes. morning on radio and um, it echoed your sentiments. I think it's yes. worth a discussion having on, on the square sometime. Let me just, just say one more thing about it, that there's nothing wrong at all with it in as long as they collect the money. <laughs> yes, so it is an economic decision. Let them make it clear. Mm. It's an economic decision and we'll be fine with it. Brenna, any midweek highlights? Uh, very briefly, yeah. can you prove that beyond reasonable <laughs> doubt? That's why I said we need the numbers. <laughs> we, 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 we need them to disclose. Well, yes. for me, as long as uh, it saves lives, uh, there's no room for debate uh, because uh, one life uh, lost is too many. Uh, but my highlight for this week is, uh, is about uh, the, so the social media post around uh, Mango. Uh, oh, yeah. Quite absurd. Yeah. And then you see this response, oh, we have, um, you know, we, we have married, uh, we employ married. <laughs> it was the most ridiculous statement. This was in, for the viewers' sakes who don't understand, it was in, you're talking to the Mango social media post that was in response to some lady who was fired, she was allegedly. terminated from her job allegedly for being pregnant. Yes, yes. allegedly. Yes. And so uh, the company decided to take action. And part of taking action was also to justify that they have married, <laughs> they employ married people, and they have, they are, you know, some pregnant, uh, whatever that means. <laughs> I mean, I, and I don't think. I really hope they don't get away with it, yeah. um, because beyond uh, reinstating, um, it will never be the same for her. Yeah, and uh, anybody who knows HR. There are many ways to get rid of someone, so she may be. It may be temporary relief, mm -hmm. you know, uh, mm -hmm. for her. Mm -hmm. But what you want to do is to protect everybody else. Mm -hmm. So I feel that uh, beyond the initiative that uh, the company has taken, mm -hmm. there should be more. Absolutely, there has to be more accountability. Absolutely, yes, I, I, I totally agree with you. Um, thank you very much for those midweek highlights. Um, of course, Charles is, is always quite loaded. <laughs> Um, with hyperbole, but yeah, it's worth having a conversation. Hopefully, the people we'll reach out to uh, will welcome our invitation to clarify a couple of things. So, 
Thank you once again to our um, uh, guests, uh, Teddy Mugabo and Mr. Mufosta, sorry, uh, Munya Zikwe. Uh, this is a very important conversation. You both came here from uh, Scotland just uh, recently. And, you know, just before we dive into this uh, climate change conversation, uh, Rwanda's green growth agenda, um, I would like you to just start by telling us what, what, what does COP26 mean, first of all, uh, to Rwanda? Why is this... Um, why is this conference so important? A lot of our delegations uh, from Rwanda, a lot of our institutions represented by delegates there. We also had youth-based uh, in initiatives represented there. If you could just start by telling us in layman's terms, especially to our viewers, um, what is the importance of this global conference? What does it mean to Rwanda? And I'll start with you, Mr. Foster, uh, and later over to Teddy. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Diana. Uh, conference uh, COP26 is an acronym uh, but it is uh, 26 conference of the parties to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. Uh, the world uh, adopted the uh, UNFCCC convention in 1992. Since then, every year uh, uh, they organize uh, this conference of the parties to assess the progress of the implementation of the convention and also set the guidelines of achieving the overall goal of the uh, convention. Uh, uh, apart from the UNFCCC, we also have some of the agreement and protocols which came from the uh, every year negotiations. We have Kyoto Protocol, which was adopted in 2005 and ended uh, in 2012. Then we have Paris Agreement, which was adopted in 2015, uh, uh, which, is, uh, which was supposed to govern the climate change regime uh, after 2020 and, uh, and onwards. So uh, uh, the importance of the Conference of the Party uh, to uh, Rwanda or Rwandans, first of all, Rwanda is uh, one of the party, uh, one of the countries which ratified the convention. It means that we have obligations to fulfill and we need to be accountable to the whole world and report back on what we are doing. Uh, so it is a, a, an opportunity and a platform of reporting and showcasing what Rwanda is doing in terms of uh, achieving the uh, objective of the convention. Uh, uh, but also uh, it is uh, the time and uh, uh, opportunity of networking with different international and regional partners uh, to learn from each other and see how we can achieve the objective of the convention. Indeed, uh, 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 in the convention itself, uh, uh, it is stated that developed countries has the obligation to avail 100 billion US dollars every year uh, to, 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 to developing countries. So uh, uh, it is the venue to see how can we attract the funds, how can we uh, uh, position ourselves to uh, uh, receive technology which is needed to be able uh, to build the resilience we want uh, in Rwanda. That's what I can say in summary. Thank you. And uh, you know, you mentioned the 100 uh, billion that's supposed to be given uh, by developing, developed countries to developing countries each year. And I'm sure this uh, lies in the fact that, you know, most countries, especially those uh, in developing uh, regions, in, especially in sub-Saharan Africa, account for less than, you know, emissions. Uh, but be, and we bear the brunt of, of, of emissions from developing, uh, developed countries. So uh, we'll talk about this, um, you know, 100, uh, uh, you know, the, the amount that you mentioned, how it's been given to developing countries, including Rwanda, where we stand, and, uh, and you know, the, the way forward. I know this was part of the COP26 discussions. Uh, I would like to go to Teddy, you know, you know what, what's the basis? I think Foster talks a lot about it, um, but the, the, the relevance of COP26 and the outcomes for Rwanda, uh, especially from the perspective of the Green Fund, from the perspective of Fonerwa. Um, thank you very much, uh, Diana. Um, I, I won't say much, uh, but I'll talk specifically why it was really important for the fund, so for the Rwanda Green Fund to, to be uh, at COP26. 
uh, our our job really uh, involves mobilizing finance so we are always uh, on the road looking for partners um, you know but also building on our existing partnerships so um, considering that COP uh, gathers uh, different partners but really not just um, from the private sector but also from public institutions we have governments that gather we have philanthropists so it's really a great opportunity for us as the Rwandan Green Fund to go there and showcase uh, what Rwanda has been able, first of all, to achieve in terms of uh, uh, addressing climate change issues and, uh, and ensuring environmental sustainability. But also, uh, as a fund, uh, we, 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 we have different, uh, we're currently developing a pipeline of different projects and different programs. So it was a great opportunity for us to, one, re-engage our existing partners, but also um, you know, um, forge new partnerships. So, uh, and I believe we did a great job, uh, considering the, the the different events and uh, and different uh, you know bilateral meetings that we had. Uh, uh, we really, you know, it was it was all worth it, and uh, we were basically positioning Rwanda as one of the best investments. Uh, sorry, as one of the best destinations for green investments. Thank you very much, uh, Teddy. We'll definitely be coming to that in terms of uh, looking at Rwanda's investment landscape uh, when we're talking about you know, green growth and green investment, especially also when it comes to young people, to youth, uh, who make up not only uh, more than half of the population of Rwanda, but also of the, Afri of the African continent at large. Um, thanks for that you know, background, um, Charles Werner. I'll come back to you after I ask them a couple of questions. Um, you know, before the show, a couple of people were asking us why climate change? Is it just a hot topic? You know, what does it really mean for the, you know, the Mturaji somewhere deep in uh, Burera? And um, I think we can see the effects of it. Um, you know, the climate driven weather, extreme weather um, changes. Uh, and, you know, like I said earlier on, a lot of developing countries like Rwanda bear the brunt of of climate change um, based on what other more developed countries um, are doing in this regard. So I would like us to just talk uh, about the carbon neutral economy. Um, Rwanda has a goal of becoming a carbon neutral and climate resilient nation by the year 2050. Um, I will address this question to Fosta. What exactly does this climate action goal mean? You know, we've been seeing this in all the research and literature for this uh, show, climate uh, neutral economy, zero net um, carbon. Uh, uh, and, and what I want to understand is what does this climate action, action goal mean? And what does it entail for us as a country to get to this goal uh, in the middle of this century? Over to you, Foster. Thank you. Thank you very much, Diana. Uh, first of all, Rwanda is among the countries which has uh, 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 least emissions uh, comparing to other developed countries. Uh, but uh, 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 with the, uh, the Paris Agreement, uh, all countries are requested to reduce their emissions, even though we have very few. So uh, when we are talking about carbon neutral, it's, it is referring to emissions of carbon. Uh, uh, in Rwanda, we have uh, uh, we do the uh, greenhouse gases inventory every two years, and uh, we are seeing emissions from different sectors, including agriculture, including uh, uh, energy, including transport, including uh, industries. Uh, but uh, 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 we we are trying after doing the inventory, we are trying to uh, set the target. How can we? mitigate or how can we reduce uh, those emissions. Uh, 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 in terms of targets, uh, as you said, uh, in our green growth and climate resilience strategy, that's when uh, 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 the country set the target of being carbon neutral by 2050. Uh, but there are two terms there which uh, uh, we need to break down. There is carbon neutral, which is referring to uh, uh, re reduction of emissions, but there is also a building resilience, which is referring to reducing vulnerability of different sectors and people exposed to climate change impacts. So when it comes for reducing emissions, uh, uh, we stated uh, 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 to be carbon neutral. Carbon neutral means that uh, uh, the emissions you have and the capacity of removal or the capacity of sequestration of carbon, it's equivalent. So there is a balance between emissions and removals. 
uh, and indeed uh, we are referring to carbon uh, we have different emissions we are tracking uh, there is uh, uh, different gases there is methane gas there is uh, SO2 but we we are we are we are all we are converting them in uh, 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 carbon equivalent uh, CO2 equivalent so that we can have the common denominator of all uh, gases we have so uh, 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 to achieve there we will not wake up in the morning and achieve uh, 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 in the 2050 that's why in our national determined contributions which has a horizon of 2030 uh, we, we had set a reduction of at least 38% uh, of emissions uh, uh, by 2030. Uh, uh, what is the meaning uh, in terms of uh, uh, figures? Uh, uh, the projections we did from business as usual, when there is no any efforts of reducing emissions, we projected that uh, Rwanda from uh, 2015 as a baseline we, we had five, uh, uh, around five uh, metric ton of CO2 equivalent, and we projected to have 12, around 12 uh, ta uh, metric tons of CO2 equivalent by 2030, without doing any effort. So that's what we call business as usual. But when you add the mitigation efforts, uh, 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 all the efforts from different sectors to reduce emissions, uh, 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 it, it will go up to around 7 metric ton of CO2 by 2030. So that reduction from 12 to 7, that's the, what, uh, what is equal to 38% of emissions. Okay. So that's when we say that's, uh, 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 it's a journey. To be carbon neutral, it will be then 100% uh, by 2050. Uh, that's the carbon. But for the re resilience again, uh, we are seeing various uh, 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 sectors being affected by climate change impacts. For instance, agriculture. We are, we, we are relying on rain-fed agriculture. But uh, what if rain doesn't come due to the uh, uh, impact of climate change, due to the drought? So we need to make sure that we are building resilience, we are increasing area of uh, irrigated uh, 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 land so that when we don't have a regular rain, we can at least grow and have product, uh, production, uh, 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 not necessarily to rely on that uh, uh, rain. That's one of the examples of building resilience of our economy. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I, my next question is to Teddy, but um, I don't know, maybe because you're talking about this, uh, Mr. Uh, Fostan, maybe you can um, just add to this. Uh, one of the, and we'll be reading our tweets later, um, just to viewers so watching, you know, hold your tweets, uh, your conversations, uh, we'll be reading them later on in the show. Uh, but one of the tweets uh, that came in, and I'd like to read it just in connection with what you said, Fostan, was that um, setting ambitious carbon offset goals is fantastic, but, but re we must remember um, that our global emission footprint is less than a quarter of, of a percent. Uh, basically, he's saying it's, it's really that small. Therefore, we should set goals that will not hurt the economy. So when you were talking about this carbon neutral economy, um, Foster, um, and maybe Teddy can weigh in on this as she answers the next question, but just very quickly to you, uh, Foster, can we give us an example of, of what, what is in place to make sure as we try and get to a carbon neutral economy, it will not hurt the current you know, economy uh, that we have as we speak? Yeah, th thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, on the issue of uh, carbon neutral and versus the economy, uh, our economy is not constant. Our economy is increasing and uh, de facto our emissions will keep increasing. So when we are talking about reducing emissions, it's not reducing uh, 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 the pace of economy, rather it is reducing Comparing to business as usual scenario, we, when we are uh, 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 computing uh, emissions, we do scenarios. <clears throat> First scenario is the business as usual, when there is no any efforts. Uh, let me give you an example for energy for cooking. Mm -hmm. The baseline, which is the business as usual, it's when you are using three stones with the firewood. 
that em you calculate the emission of that and then when you are using an improved cook stove you can say okay i was still cooking the same meal uh, but i'm using different technology and emissions are reduced then from the improved cook stove when you go to uh, use lpg the lpg will be having less emission than uh, improved cook stove so it's it's a matter of uh, 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 changing the technology but not slowing or impeding the economy mm -hmm. the economy will keep increasing but we will make sure that we are increasing in a greener way so that we can embrace a uh, uh, technology which will help us to reduce those emissions that's how when we are doing projections uh, or, or scenarios we need to have the business as usual which is uh, the, the one uh, which is setting the tone and then project when we do this it will reduce uh, 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 emissions in this way mm -hmm. but it doesn't necessarily mean that you will reduce uh, uh, the pace of economy okay thank o you of economic development thank you um over to you teddy um the next question is to talk about you know financing models um investment plans regarding regarding climate change actions and um of course um like um foster said earlier on, on in order to achieve our ndc's our national determined contributions um to run this green growth agenda we need a finance model that blends the uh, public and uh, private sector um, uh, funding for investments if you could tell us more about the green investment facility, Teddy, and how Rwandan green growth projects, uh, both in the private and public se sector, uh, how can they access funds from this facility uh, in trying to you know, contribute mm -hmm. to, to our climate action change goals? Mm -hmm. Um, thank you very much, Diana. So allow me to, to take a step back. And actually, sure. I want to also follow up on the, on the question that was raised. Uh, that really do we, do, should we uh, stop or sort of slow the pace of our economic development because we have to go green. Mm -hmm. and, and I just wanted to say that we need to sort of differentiate two things. There's the now and then there's the future. So uh, uh, unfortunately, climate, we did not cause, the developing countries did not cause uh, climate change. However, we are impacted by climate change. Uh, 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 we are actually vulnerable. And if we can take an example uh, of Rwanda specifically, um, I'm sure all of you have been uh, experiencing, you know, like the different parts of, of Rwanda. When you look at the northern part of Rwanda, uh, the severe, um, you know, rainfall and flooding, which has a significant impact on uh, various sectors. If we can take an example, the infrastructure sector. Um, um, and then you also have the eastern province, uh, that experiences droughts, and this has a significant impact again on, you know, agriculture. So what we're trying to say that um, by by setting the goal to become a carbon neutral economy is that right now we need to adapt, uh, and that's why I'm going to talk about the financing after. Yes. We need to adapt to the climate change impacts we're facing now. But we also know that uh, Rwanda aspires to become a middle income country, so we have to develop. But how do we develop? Which pathway do we take? Do we develop in the normal way that the Western world did, uh, which led to climate change? Or do we um, consider a, a, a greener and a sustainable pathway? So I, I just wanted to highlight that. Now, as, coming back to the question you, 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 you raised, Diana, I think before I talk about the, the green investment facility, it's also worth highlighting you know, what the fund has, you know, first of all, why Fonera in the first place? So uh, in 2010, um, the, uh, a green growth and climate resilience strategy was adopted by cabinet. And this was basically a strategy which um, sort of came up with 14 programs of action, uh, focusing on key sector um, development sectors. So basically showing how do we develop in a clean and resilient you know, following a clean and resilient pathway. So basically where, where it says that so the infrastructure sector needs to develop in this way if we're going to build a road how do we build a road in consideration of future climate change how do we make sure that we have drainage systems if it's agriculture how do we consider that you know tomorrow we might not have rain so we can have irrigation and then now after that there was the realization that okay we can aspire to be this uh, this carbon uh, you know resilient country but how do we achieve this if we don't have finance so that's how, um, you know, sort of Vonera, the fund, Rwanda Green Fund, 
came into existence, which basically was that we needed to have a national fund uh, to act as a, as a financing vehicle to attract financing, which would help implement this strategy. And so, um, so FONERA was established in 2013, and so far we've been able to, to mobilize over $200 million. Uh, but all of this has been through, through public uh, finance. So we have uh, different development partners that have come on board, including, you know, DFID now right now, the FCDO, KFWU. We have uh, multilateral uh, partners such as the Green Climate Fund, the World Bank. Um, but uh, so far from 2013, we've, we've only, uh, we've supported over 44 projects, but 90% um, of the projects are actually public and uh, NGOs. So in 2018, we sort of took a step back and said, why are we not supporting more of the private sector projects? So we did a quick market assessment to understand uh, sort of the investment needs, the gaps, the challenges, and why really um, the private sector wasn't accessing these funds. Uh, and so um, this revealed a number of things, a number of challenges. One is that the green sector is something new. I think this is something that, as you can see, when you talk about climate change or you talk about green, people don't really understand what do we mean by this. So um, what this means is that if you have an entrepreneur or you know, a project developer who wants to intervene in the green sector, if they go to the commercial bank to get a loan, the commercial bank is not going to understand this sector because it's, 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 it's something new, mm -hmm. it's something that has a lot of uncertainties. So, so the commercial banks are going to sort of be, um, you know, they won't have that much appetite to support this project. The second challenge is, um, you know, there wasn't um, availability of long-term finance. Now, this is something that is also very important when it comes to the, the green sector, considering that uh, I think for Stan was just talking about it, considering that we're talking about new technologies. If we want to develop in a cleaner and using these, um, in, in a cleaner pathway, we need alternatives. We need to have alternative technologies. So this means that, um, you know, um, we will also have to think of how do we come up with tailored financial products which can support um, the private sector players who are at different stages of the business life cycle. So this means that you may have a, a young entrepreneur who has an amazing idea um, to recycle or use recycled, uh, you know, products to develop. Uh, so I'm just trying to think of an example. I know of some of some young entrepreneur who was trying to make pavements out of recycled uh, plastics, plastics mm -hmm. or you know, so stuff like that. But like that particular entrepreneur is not ready to go to the bank. Mm -hmm. They probably need some business dev support. They need to come up with a bankable project, and so on. And then um, another challenge is the, the high uh, capital cost needed, you know, high collaterals. Now, to move, sorry, they, they, I could go on and on, but now that's how we came to realize that we need to have or set up a, a, you know, an investment facility. And that's how we're coming up with this green investment facility, which is a, a, a facility that is being operationalized uh, uh, in partnership uh, between uh, the Rwanda Green Fund and Development Bank of Rwanda. And the whole idea is to provide, is one, to address, to address uh, accessibility and affordability of green finance by providing uh, tailored financial products. Uh, so it will basically have two windows, one project preparatory facility that sits under Fonera and a credit facility that sits under BRD. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the project preparatory facility that sits under Fonera will help those um, sort of the beginning, the init initial ideation stages of projects. So, for example, if you want to move into hydropower or you want to, yeah, you're a developer that wants to, to intervene in a hydropower project, but you need some financing to develop, uh, to, to come up with a feasibility study. So there, the PPF, the Project Preparatory Facility, can give you some a reimbursable grant to do your feasibility study, which will also, at the end of the day, de-risk the project by the time it goes to the credit facility. So that's the whole idea of blended finance is how do we continue doing the work we've been doing as Fonera to attract public finance, which we can then use um, to, to, to de-risk mm -hmm. uh, de pri private sector projects, but also uh, leverage uh, more private uh, finance that can come in and support. And if I can just give one example of a few of sure. the projects. Sure. Sorry. Yes. One example. at the 
I'm sure most of you have heard of Ampersand. Yes. It's an electric mobility solution startup. Um, we actually, so Fonera supported Ampersand, uh, um, the, the, you know, by providing a grant of up to $200,000. And uh, just the other day, even when we were at COP, they managed to leverage nine million from DFC. So with just 200,000 um, of worth of uh, $200,000, they've managed to, uh, attract, to leverage uh, over 10 million uh, dollars uh, from uh, venture capital. So we hope this is what we really want to do more in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Teddy. Thank you for Stella. Thank you for your practical examples. And I think for me, you know, before I go to Brenna and then Charles, um, one of the, the, the big things uh, that I'm picking up, you know, sort of, you know, not a learning curve, but just a reminder is that um, while people may not understand this now, I think the big thing with um, green growth or the green agenda is looking into the future. We need to leave, you know, a habitable environment, a habitable world for future generations. And just listening to both of you, um, I think definitely a lot more awareness needs to be done across the country to make people understand across the board the importance of thinking 50 to 100 years into the future. You know, that's one of the big pickups I got from what you're both saying. Uh, so, you know, there might be some gaps here and there, um, some issues in adoption or adaptation. But honestly, what Rwanda is doing right now is really thinking way, way into the future uh, because there's no development uh, with a degraded you know, environment. So um, you know, I, I hope we'll be talking more of that. But thanks for that. Um, you know, my, my personal take is just uh, what we are doing now is really looking to the future of, of, of future generations in Rwanda and, and possibly you know, the region. Brenna, over to you. Um, I think it's... Um it's interesting uh, listening to, to, to her and what they've been uh, able to achieve. Um, Rwanda has been at it actually for quite some time now uh, in terms of uh, transitioning the ambition. It's an ambition to transition into uh, a green economy because you, you don't separate what is happening today from the plastic bags ban that mm. Made headlines, you know. So it's a journey that has been going on uh, for quite some time. Um, but I must say that um, it's not as easy as it sounds. Um, and I also have uh, my own reservations uh, every time I hear uh, the developing world saying uh, we, we we don't contribute, we are not uh, responsible for this. But the fact is, it's because you're underdeveloped anyway. So <laughs> you your capacity is limited. Uh, and whether you can move from developing to developed mm -hmm. under the current framework of the green economy and do it as fast as you want. You know, all countries have uh, visions, you know, vision 2050. Whether you can do that or countries can afford to do that following the rules around the green economy, I don't know. So we are likely to see that uh, we will continue to be underdeveloped and crying that we need money, mm -hmm. there's that risk mm -hmm. unless there's a bit of bold decision making in terms of one, prioritizing growing the economy so that you don't remain underdeveloped and some of these things you're able to fund them yourself mm -hmm. uh, because again as we, we, we saw from uh, COP26, every country there was trying to find its own, you know, what can I get from, from, from this meeting? Mm -hmm. And a lot of negotiations, tough negotiations, um, the rich countries, again, because they have the resources, they bully everyone into, <laughs> into an agreement, mm -hmm. uh, which in a sense may not be realistic in terms of what uh, the developing world wants to achieve in terms of its development agenda. Yeah. So. I want to be cautiously optimistic about uh, the outcomes of, of COP26. First of all, the pledges that were done how many years ago in terms of financing, that financing has not come. We've, we are just in the middle of a pandemic and it would be too optimistic to assume that even with these pledges you will get them. Mm -hmm. Which means we have uh, to look internally and find ways of, you know, making sure that we don't rely on external resources. I don't think that the green economy will be achieved if we continue to focus on the external resources. But there are small things that we can do. And again, the plastic bags is, is, is a good example. If you look at what's happening uh, 
with the cycling, um, and also the huge debate that is happening today around uh, the, the fines, mm. the ambition under the green economy as, at least on paper, is that you need less cars on the road. I'm telling you, yes. You're tying in the fines to having less <laughs> yes, you, cars you, on the you, road? Yes, you need less cars on the road unless they are rechargeable. Yeah. Unless they, you know, and as we know today, most of the cars actually are not mm. friendly. Yeah. So you need more people uh, using uh, transport, a transport system that is, is good for our environment. And I don't think the current vehicles that we have mm -hmm. are, you know, are sustainable. So what we have to do, first of all, uh, I think uh, Volkswagen is doing this, but again, it's still small how you scale up what, uh, for instance, Volkswagen is trying to do. Mm -hmm. We know that currently very few people can afford uh, vehicles from Volkswagen. How do you uh, make those affordable? Um, and let me bring it closer to the issue that we are grappling with most recently of waste management. Mm -hmm. In relation to the pandemic, we have a problem of disposal of masks. Mm -hmm. It is a big problem. Mm -hmm. So it is good that we are making progress. Uh, we have some investments that have come in. Uh, the ambition uh, is there. You have the political will, which is very important. Uh, even if it was a global meeting, not all countries were represented. Uh, the delegations were not, you know, as empowered as the one from Rwanda, even that. So where you have the political will, I think what remains is really to get the teams to do what they're actually supposed to do, and then you move forward. Yeah, very valid, very valid points, Brenna. And I'm very sure that um, Foster and Teddy will be answering some of your key concerns um, you know, later on. Charles, over to you. Um, first of all, this is very, very specific to Teddy and Foster. I, I, I listen and talk to a lot of people uh, in the green space, in the carbon emission space, and, and, and I've, most of them are usually very alarmist. They are usually <laughs> very... And, and, and you, you, sound like, is, you sound like a Trumpist now, <laughs> yeah? no, no, no. like one of Donald uh, Trump's Teddy people. Teddy and are the ones, the, the, the most calm <laughs> that, 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 that I have come across. But uh, uh, that said, I think sometimes we, we really need to break down these things to a layman's language for people mm. to understand what it means. Yeah. Um, for people to understand that if you burn uh, 10 hectares of trees, if you bring down 10 hectares of trees to burn charcoal, this is what it means to you. And in the future. You and know, in the future. The so we, we, yeah. And break it down to, 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 to somebody's very, very, very basic knowledge. Mm. So. So Ban Ali Aron talked about an example of, of polythene, mm. right? So I got extremely embarrassed today. Uh, I was watching uh, uh, a cricket game at Gahanga. Uh, it's a World Cup qualifier between Nigeria and Uganda. And uh, the Nigerians came with a very big delegation of fans. And they ordered food mm. from a local Nigerian restaurant to be delivered to them. And their fufu, so one of their favorite local dishes, was served in polythene. A, a polythene, a rounded polythene. Yeah. So I asked one of the guys, is it biodegradable, is it what? I dazzled them with a lot of, <laughs> of the little uh, green language that I know. And they told me, the fufu is nice, do you want to test it? <laughs> so... Uh, where I'm going with this conversation, I think we really need to break it down as simple as that and to understand what does it mean in our day-to-day -day lives to reduce carbon footprint. Yeah. You, you, you can't go to somebody in Gasarend and say you're importing uh, uh, electric vehicles and he resonates with it. Mm. You can't go to somebody in Chimisagara and tell them stop using charcoal and then you reduce the price of gas. You re, sorry, increase the price of gas, and they resonate with it. So I, I, I think we need to break it down. We need to break it down to say this is what we actually mean by the impact of uh, carbon emissions. This is what we actually, in a way that somebody actually understands the, the, the ordinary person. But I want to link that to... to, 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 to um, 
which is one of the biggest failures um, uh, of COP, uh, the, the size of investments. Mm -hmm. yeah. when, when you look at the big industries and uh, the, the, the biggest of global players, you can imagine what it takes to build a coal plant. Mm -hmm. Somebody is not going to invest $10 billion in a coal plant and you tell them, can you play a significant role in financing Fonerwa mm. before they start recouping their investments. The government of Rwanda has spent years and years in studies and it's only recent that we've started um, generating a, uh, a few megawatts we are so happy about in our methane gas plant at COP. You are telling us methane gas is not good for our, for our skies. <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine what that means to the government of Rwanda and whoever is backing our methane gas plant? Yes, they tell us that, that the rate at which the emissions uh, sort of have an impact is a lot slower than other, and, and first I'm explaining this in a layman's language, uh, is a lot slower. I'm, I'm, I get a relief, but it's a slap in the face Absolutely. of the government of Rwanda. So we, we need to really break it down in layman's terms for, for everybody to understand. But the, the, the third and final point that I want to raise, uh, Diana, is that when it comes to our day-to-day -day lives mm. and, and, and the impact, and uh, I, earlier on I talked about cooking and cooking gas, mm. uh, but I also want to give an example of my day-to-day -day life of buildings and, 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 and Actually, and, I was hoping you'd get into construction. Yes, yes, yes. yes. <laughs> and green construction. So, so the, the, the cost of actually greening a building is or, or building a green, whether it's a house or whatever, the, the cost, the initial cost is a lot higher, than but the ultimate goal yes. is a lot cheaper. So the long term, yes, benefits. the long term goal. So if you're going to tell me uh, glass or cross ventilation or you know, there's there's a lot of these things that uh, that uh, that a lot of terms that I may dazzle you with um, that, that, that are extremely nice mm. but in the, in the long term gain there's a particular commercial building in the, Kigali, in the city of Kigali mm. that got an award for a 6 star rating from a design perspective 3 years later it has not gotten financing because it is too expensive to build mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. so wait you're saying from so, the architecture and from a design perspective, design perspective it's yeah. extremely But the actual construction, it's and it's a green building, but yes. the actual construction... The construction becomes extremely expensive. Mm -hmm. Now, who caters for that financial burden mm -hmm. for something that has a, that has a long-term gain? Benefit, yeah. 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 Thank you very much, yeah. Charles and Brenna. Um, uh, and I think, um, you know, this ties in with what's the, the, the green facility. This is what will, you know, attract this sort of an, uh, the, the, these investments will yeah. attract funding, not the usual business as usual commercial yeah. banks. And I think Teddy will talk on that. Uh, just very quickly before we go back to Teddy and Foster. Yes, yeah, Teddy. I think Charlie raises an important point. You know, how do you de-risk the sector? You know, green investments. It's still a big issue. Mm -hmm. uh, also because the moment you see a lot of uh, donor funding around projects like it is today. Um, most of the initiatives are funded by donors. That is not sustainable. Yes. How do you attract private capital yes. that actually looks at green as a viable you know, investment? Mm -hmm. And I think probably that's what uh, Teddy and the teams are, are working on. Absolutely. But I would want that we do more in terms of, again, raising awareness yeah. on how, Absolutely. at a personal level, you can reduce, you know. Uh, for instance, reusing just your cup, your coffee cup. Most of us, mm -hmm. almost every day, you are at a coffee shop and you're, you Throwing know. Throwing it yeah, away. Yes. You know, yeah. 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 Or you're going shopping and you're not taking your bag. You, you have to buy a bag every time, time, you you know, yeah. you go shopping. Yeah. So if we can have some of these basic campaigns mm. to send a message. I think that would also Absolutely. help. Yeah. And, and Brenda and Charles, I feel like, you know, this is what you're both saying. A lot more awareness needs to be done to the lay person. Very practical, practical, Same. simple, easy to absorb and easy to replicate terms. Um, 
like you said. I'd like to go back to our, our guests. Um, very interesting, very, very interesting insights here. And, um, you know, before we go to our Twitter feed, um, I would like to go to you for Stan Teddy, uh, just to answer some of the concerns and, um, you know, submissions from Brandon and Charles. And I'll start with you for Stan. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Diana. Uh, thank you, colleagues, for good questions and um, some reflections. Uh, let me start with the, 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 the question of 100 billion. Uh, which have been pledged but uh, uh, never uh, fulfilled. Uh, to be honest, uh, uh, it's a disappointment. It's a disappointment from vulnerable countries, from developing countries. Uh, this pledge has been made in 2009 uh, in Copenhagen, and it was uh, uh, reaffirmed in 2015 when we adopted the Paris Agreement. But yet, until 2020, uh, uh, it was not achieved. Uh, 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 but uh, it didn't uh, uh, kill our hope. It killed our trust for the developed world, but it didn't kill our hope because before going to the COP, there is uh, 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 a wonderful report which have been produced by uh, uh, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, uh, uh, which was on how, how countries, developed countries, are intending to deliver on 100 billion. So the report portrayed that they, uh, they, they will fulfill 100 billion by 2023. So at least from there, you can uh, uh, sit on the table and start discussing. But until they are not yet even telling you why are they uh, not fulfilling their commitments, that's uh, an issue. Uh, uh, then uh, I, I conquer with you that before depending on external finance, external aid, we need to see how we can uh, do uh, 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 what we want to do using our our means. Mm. That's why in our national determined contributions, uh, uh, to be able to achieve what we want to achieve, it will require 11 billion as uh, highlighted. But 40% of that 11 billion is what we call uh, uh, unconditional uh, 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 contribution. It is the domestic uh, uh, co uh, uh, funds which will come from uh, our treasury, which will come from our uh, partners, but the internal resources. And then 60% is the what will, will come from outside. Mm. So you can see that we are not just relying on everything, relying on external uh, funds. funds. Uh, then coming back to the issue of costs um, uh, and uh, uh, especially for the green technology, you highlighted the electric vehicles and everything. To be honest, it's a matter of changing mindset and understand that there is a journey we need to walk. You can't wake up in the morning and embrace 100% electric vehicles, but you need where to start and you need uh, some milestones which will indicate you where you're heading. So oh, 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 I'm saying it's a, mat a matter of uh, changing mindset, giving an example of electric cars. Rema recently, uh, last year, we bought an electric car. Uh, in different projects from different government uh, institutions, we are buying new branded cars. But when I look at the cost of that car, which was around uh, uh, 60 million uh, uh, Rwandan francs, it's this. It's around the figure of the Jeep um, of the Rwanda cruisers have been buying. <laughs> but when we see the reduction of the cost of been paying for fuel and maintenance of every month, because those those big jeeps are going to the field every day, so you, maybe every every two weeks they go to for services. So if we look at the gains we got, to be honest, it's just a matter of changing mindset and start embracing the, 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 the new technology. 
Uh, 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 Foster, um, I would like to stop you there, but um, I want you to know that definitely we're going to continue this conversation on our social media feed, um, because otherwise, if you go on, we will not hear from our viewers. <laughs> and there's some very interesting questions that I want us to hear our viewers from. So I'm, I'm very sorry, but um, we'll definitely keep this conversation going online. Teddy, over to you very quickly, just answering some of Brenna and Charles's um, interventions before we go to our social media feed. Thank you. Thank you, Charles. Thank you, Brenna. I, I believe Postan covered on all of them, but um, just wanted to also highlight on the 100 billion that was not achieved. It's true, this was an, a disappointment. However, I believe that we also shouldn't get lost in this conversation. Again, I, I, like Brennan said it very well, different countries went there for different reasons. And yes, COP26 was a disappointment on the different, many different, you know, whether it's the, the financing, um, but but um, for us as Rwanda and uh, and really uh, I, I still think that it, it I wouldn't say that it wasn't a success because what makes us um, well at least stand out is the fact that we have this this fund at a national level mm. uh, which still allows us to some extent we are still in a position to mobilize this financing and so the political will I believe is very important. Um, you know, um, we, 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 we have, uh, we're building this, this, these investment plans. We have an ambitious target. So I just wanted to really highlight that we shouldn't also get lost in these big, uh, bigger global conversations, but how do we rather stay focused? And then on the, on the, on the issue that uh, Charles mentioned around uh, green construction being very expensive, Charles, this is why we're creating the Green Investment Facility. Uh, like I mentioned, um, one of the things we want to offer is affordable finance, long-term finance, um, but also de-risk some of these projects because the upfront capital cost is usually high. Mm -hmm. So that's why we will have the project preparatory facility that can provide um, you know, grants for feasibility studies, which in the end will make the projects more bankable. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Teddy. Um, very, I feel like I'm in a, a classroom, sorry, uh, with, <laughs> with Teddy and Foster, just learning more about, um, you know, Rwanda's green growth agenda. I would like us to just go to our Twitter feed, if you could have the first feed on the screen. And these are viewers who have been following the conversation, who are uh, key uh, followers of the square, but also who have been following the conversation on uh, Rwanda's green growth uh, agenda. If you could have this on our screens, please. The first tweet is from Delapo, who says that uh, a UN scientist, Professor uh, Foster, blamed leaders at COP26 for the failure to do the necessary thing, as it will not be possible to bring climate temperature to the stipulated level in this century. Very sobering words from Dolapo, um, and it, he echoes what um, you know, our guests have been saying. He goes on to say, the general feedback from most African leaders and delegates who attended were, a lot of the pledges weren't realistic in solving climate change, especially as there was a lot of greenwashing, uh, in brackets, a new climate change terminology at the conference. Um, I remember seeing an article with the Minister of Environment and Greta Thunberg. Um, we don't have time for that, but yeah, I, 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 yeah, the political article. Yes, I, I yes. like that. Um, we have another tweet from Eric, and he says, "I'm interested to know how the ongoing initiatives to reduce imported cars and promote the use of non-motorized transport (NMTs) will contribute to uh, CO2 emissions in terms of numbers." Uh, thank you for that uh, technical question, Eric. Uh, our other tweet uh, coming in is from Octave, who says. Thanks for the critical thinking discussion, all about climate change and CO2 reduction. I would like to ask if there's some projects that will be working on the solid waste disposal, disposal, especially reinforcing the circular economy. What do you think about industrial symbiosis? Um, great question wow. from Octave. Uh, I remember we had a discussion on the circular economy sometime, uh, I think last year. Another tweet from Delapo uh, coming in says, a lot of Western countries are in the fourth industrial revolution, and a lot of developing countries are still in the industrial age. Mm. Leapfrogging from the former to the latter requires funds mm. and especially policies which are homemade. This absolutely resonates with what Teddy and Foster have been sharing with us tonight. Uh, we have another tweet coming in from Coletta. I believe this is the Coletta who was actually mm. once on the square, mm. Engineer Coletta. Um, and she says, taking a green development path is not about impeding our development. It's about avoiding mistakes done by developed countries that have caused climate change. Absolutely. With available technologies, we can develop in a more sustainable way. Uh, I don't know if we have another tweet uh, after Colette. Um, well, we have uh, from, several. <laughs> several from the lab. For, I'll just read this one from the last before we go to our guests. Um, for developing nations to leapfrog, um, 
from industrial age uh, to fourth industrial revolution without damaging the air quality, ETC involves funds. And since it appears that these funds are still pledges, developing countries have to engage climate change issues in the best ways that fit it economically. Mm. Thank you so much. We have, um, geez, we have no time. Uh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> yeah, I, like I said earlier on, this has been like a classroom. You know, yeah. we've just been learning. Um, Charles, I've loved your, your submissions. Brenna, I've loved yours. There's one final. Uh, there's one final tweet Brenna wants me to read. Um, I don't know where it is. <laughs> Um, from Alex yeah. Divwami, okay, this is the last tweet guys, um, who says that fuel prices have always caused a problem when they go up, yet car owners have not necessarily considered electric options, public transport, cycling, or walking to work. Mm -hmm. In addition to green alternatives, mm -hmm. we need to nurture certain values first, then mainstream key support mechanisms. Guys, um, there have been brilliant <laughs> submissions on this topic. Charles Brenner, thank you very much. I'd like our cameras to go to our guests because I'd like to thank them on behalf of the panel, on behalf of the viewers. If you could have our cameras on Teddy and uh, Foster. I'd like to thank you both for coming to this show. Um, and thank you very much for your submissions. And I honestly hope that this is a conversation we can have several times. Cameras back on our guests. Thank you so much, <laughs> Teddy and Foster. Thank, thank, you. thank you very much. Thank you so much for having us. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, to our viewers, keep the conversation going using hashtag the square RW. Uh, we'll definitely have this conversation going on on social media. It's been an awesome uh, learning curve, not only for us uh, on the panel, but I'm sure for our viewers. To our partners, Bourbon, collection, uh, Bourbon uh, Coffee and Uzi Collections, thank you for all this partner partnering with the square. Have a good night. See you all again next week. Thank you.